Welcome to this webinar of the Royal Anthropological Institute with today's guest, Joy Henry from Scotland. Um, so this is just a bit of housekeeping at the beginning. Um, and we have two RAI staff here. That's me, Hanin, and my colleague, Emma. Hello. Um, <laughs> who will be monitoring the chat box. The chat box is there for any practical questions, like you can tell us that you don't hear as well or something like that. So she'll be responding to those. And you find these uh, different controls, uh, chat, raise hand, and the Q&A. You find them all uh, at the bottom of your screen if you're coming in through a laptop. Uh, if you're coming in through a tablet, you will probably find them at the upper right-hand corner. And if you don't see them immediately, you just hover in that area with your cursor and it should appear, or you click on your screen and it should appear. Um, so, um, for the Q&A section, which we'll have after Joy's talk, um, you can ask the subject related questions in this Q&A box. And you can ask questions by um, typing them in via text. You can also ask them anonymously. So you can check, uh, ask anonymously next to the send button. And if you would like to ask a question directly with your voice being heard um, by everybody, you're okay with that then you can raise your hand. You just click on the raise your hand button. Um, and then we may not be able to answer all the questions. Emma, in Emma, the session. And Emma, can you, let, can you let her in? She's one of the direct, the filmmakers, thank you. Sorry. And also please everybody know that the content of this event is recorded and might be shared afterwards. So if you don't want your voice to be on a recording, please ask your question on in text form and anonymously. Okay, so that's all from me as a start. I'm gonna hand over to our director and chair of this event, David Shanklin now. David, please. Well, thank you very much, Hanin, and uh, hello everybody. It's a great pleasure to be able to have this seminar. For us, it's of course a source of great sadness that we've been forced to close the RAI for the duration but we do periodically check the building and we can assure everybody that 50 Fitzroy Street is up and standing and we'll be back there as soon as we can. At the moment though, we've got the great pleasure of welcoming uh, Professor Joy Henry to talk about the, the film about her reacquaintance with the Japanese village where she did her field work. And Joy is simply one of the most distinguished anthropologists in the country and a great specialist on Japan. Probably it's best if we go straight into Joy's presentation now because we want to stop strictly at three o'clock so that people don't get screen fatigue. So we simply need to just have a round of applause now for Joy Hendry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much David. It's a um, really weird situation to be doing this um, but I'd like to thank you all for coming and uh, to this new uh, experience of having a, a webinar and we're all living in unusual times and in some ways it's scary, lonely and restricting. But here is an exciting new possibility to invite people from all over the world and to ask questions and offer comments on the film that you've seen and uh, that uh, my son James and his partner made. Now they're here as well and um, they will also be able to answer questions later on. So uh, that's great. And um, actually, I'm going to open up my PowerPoint at this point. So there's a picture for you of the filmmakers and uh, also um, some of the people who were in the film. I hope I'll be able to get to up here. Yes, there they are. <clears throat> the two people up top right are my other son and uh, James, who were doing a bit of editing at Christmas. You can see my other son having a good laugh, but... Uh, he did make a contribution and I hope he's here too. So it's a great opportunity to have these people who I don't often see and Nadine, who is James's partner, with whom he made the film and you can see them working there. Um, we also have at Sushi, I don't know if you can see my little arrow here, but he's there in the film below and I don't know if his son's there, but uh, he's Dr. Kumagai, who should be here with us. And Mutsuko Kawaii, who's in that picture and is also hopefully with us. 
Um, and I, we also, I believe, have the director, um, of Jason James and Susan Meehan from the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation. So I'd like to thank you for the funding for my visit, visit last year. And then, funnily enough, we also have the person who painted this picture behind me on this. If you can still see my picture behind, you'll see it later, if not now. Helen Ganley, who is a friend who's an artist, and I happen to have her picture on my wall. I know people take an interest in these things in Zoom webinars, so there now, you know, <clears throat> it's of Oxford, not Scotland. Um, okay, so let's, let's move on. Um, I'm going to start, I uh, thank you for watching the film. I'm going to come back to the film shortly and I look forward to your questions. But I'm going to start by making a little presentation about the background to how I got to be in the village, because in the film it just starts, I was there 45 years ago. So I thought I'd just fill you in a little bit about how I got there in the first place. Um, and uh, <coughs> doctoral students back in uh, the <coughs> 1970s used to set out for a reasonably distant location and spend a year gathering information about the place for a thesis. I did that in 1975-76, as you saw in the film. We didn't get training in research methods in those days, so it was very much learning on the job. Um, and uh, for me, it was lucky that I'd lived in Japan for six months before I studied social anthropology in Tokyo with a house full of Japanese friends. And you can see the house in the present picture and some of my friends. And I traveled all over the country before I came back to the UK with one of them and sometimes two. So you see the two and the one. My friends Yasuro Takahara, who reappears shortly. And uh, that was Yoko, another person who was in the house. So I spoke a modicum of Japanese when I set off to do field work and I had a few contacts in Tokyo and in Kyushu because that's where Yasuro and Yoko were from. Uh, for academic support, um, in the Oxford Department of Social Anthropology at the time, I'd met three Japanese anthropologists who came um, to study there uh, and they're there on your screen, Aoki Tamots, um, who very kindly met me when I arrived in Tokyo. And it was really funny because his university was having, um, uh, his students were having a protest, so you couldn't get into the university. So we had to meet through a, a wire fence. And uh, he very kindly introduced me to my supervisor, Professor Yoshida, who you also see on the screen there. Sadly, he passed away two years ago at the age of 95, but for his whole life, he was a great supporter and friend. So I set off and I visited various possible sites for fieldwork. I hadn't decided on the village when I left Oxford. Uh, I went to one in Shikoku where the local education office closed for a day to take me to possible houses. And uh, it was beautiful, but sadly many young people were leaving, so there weren't many weddings and I was going to look at marriage, so that wouldn't work. Um, I also was going to look at Noto Peninsula in Japan, and this is a funny story because I was remember there was no internet in those days, not even mobile phones. There was no way of communicating. But I was on a Shinkansen on the bullet train and I knew that an anthropologist I wanted to meet was on it too. So I asked the guard to put out a call for him and he did. And he'd worked in the Noto Peninsula. I'd been told he was there. So we got together. He said, no, 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 don't go there. It's full of Japanese anthropologists doing their training. He said, you'd better find somewhere more uh, unusual. So I ended up going to Kyushu, as you now all know. And this farming community is where I, I worked. And in Kyushu, Professor Matsunaga Kazuto gave me a lot of practical support. He was introduced by Professor Yoshida. And then a local politician called Nishie Toshiyuki, whose golden bust you may have seen in the film, introduced me to the village. Uh, while I was waiting for all this to be arranged, because it did take a few weeks to find a house and so on, um, I was uh, helped very much by my friend Yasuro Takahara and his family. So there's Mrs. Takahara who put me up, well, in, they were in Saga, put me up while I was waiting to move to the village and um, also took me to, oops, pressed the wrong button there, sorry. Oops, let's see. Get out of that one. Um, she took me to uh, the Arita market. In the spring, they have a market when they sell off quite a lot of beautiful pottery, Arita yaki, um, quite cheaply. So as you can see, my kitchen 
in that house that we had, which you saw in the film. And Dennis, my husband is in it, has lots of beautiful Arita pottery. So she also lent me heavy things that it would be difficult for me to buy. So I uh, had that help settling in, which was very useful. <clears throat> So there, you have some background to how I arrived there. And um, if you want to ask any questions about that, there'll be an opportunity shortly. But I thought I'd move on. I promised in the blurb that you all received to talk about um, a little bit about my feelings with regard to doing uh, field work. And uh, I put, I called this talk, An Affair with the Village. Well, I've also written a book uh, called An Affair with the Village, which I started in 1976 when I came back and which I finished thanks to the lockdown because I was stuck at home with lots of time and have submitted to a publisher. But of course, publishers lockdown, so it'll be a while before it comes out. But I thought I'd tell you about the chapters because this is, I called the, the book An Affair with the Village. Uh, and I called the chapters things which relate to the idea of having an affair, something slightly illegitimate. So one of them is called First Encounter, Introductions, Wooing, as I tried to get to know people, Building Relationships, Staying Over, when people invited me to stay, I was always delighted to do so, so I was learning more about people's inside family lives. Uh, living Together, because I lived with one family, the Kuma guys, who you've met in the film. Um, and uh, that was great. And then there's a chapter called Betrayal, uh, first breakup when I left, of course, to come back. First glorious return, which I'll come back to shortly because I've put a couple of slides in about um, uh, the returns. <clears throat> and then one called Infidelity, and I'll tell you about how they work shortly. So the reason, these are some of the reasons why I chose the word affair. Fieldwork is very personal and intimate. And um, the first thing that my husband and I did, my husband almost never came to the village, but he did agree to come to a wedding. And it was the wedding of the son of the head of the village. And he invited us to the wedding, which was great. It was my subject looking at weddings and marriage. So along we went, but what we didn't realize was the strength of the sake that was being served. So everybody came up to us with little pots of sake and we were going, yes, yeah, oh, how nice, thank you very much, yes, and greeting everybody. Um, and then weddings, in, at least in Kyushu and in rural Japan, probably more generally, are places where people talk about very intimate matters relating to their relationships. What I said, I have no idea. But I have to say that nobody ever refused to answer any questions that I asked them about their lives. And so we did, you know, I did have a relationship with the people in that village, which was very close and friendly. Um, I fell in the river on my way home from that wedding, but fortunately my husband pulled me out. It's awful not being able to hear whether you laughed or not, but anyway, here we go. Um, the other aspect of it is that it's slightly illegitimate to be interfering in people's lives and to be asking questions about, um, about them. Um, I had a, a, a really good friend in the local policeman when I was there who gave me details that now would, I'm sure would be illegal to hand out about everybody in the village. And they were, uh, they were, and I went around every house and said, I've been told this about you, is this right? And they would put it right. Now, if I'd been working in another part of the world, because I know later I worked with uh, First Nations in Canada, people would, resent this kind of information being given out. But I have to say that those villages that I worked with in Japan uh, were most cooperative. And even when I got further information for the family trees, which you saw in the film, they always agreed. In fact, I had to get them to agree to get that information from the, the town hall. So, you know, I have to have the agreement. Um, <clears throat> but uh, doing field work and working in a village and going back, and in a minute, I'm gonna show you how many times I went back takes up a huge amount of time. And so it does uh, become a, a, a real lifetime preoccupation. And during it, you experience highs and lows. This is what I've argued in the book anyway, usually associated with personal relationships. So I would be nervous, but excited about going every time I went to the village, what am I gonna to ask today? Will people answer? And those sort of things uh, that, um, 
sometimes would be wonderful. So I'd arrive and find things were all ready for me and I'd be joyful because I'd been accepted. But sometimes I would be rejected. And I've got one chapter, the one called Betrayal, about when they had, that's the little shrine that you probably saw in the film with no bamboo behind it. It's much clearer now. And that, when I was first there, is what it looked like. They had a festival at it and nobody told me. So I missed, actually it was the passing on of the care of it. So that was one of the pains of being forgotten because <clears throat> they claimed just to have forgotten. But anyway, there we go. That, that's the highs and lows. So then um, I uh, told you a little bit about the, the um, feelings associated with, I was going to read this, but it's working out that I'm not actually reading it at all. Um, so what I thought I'd do uh, is just tell you a little bit about the periods I went back because in the film you saw the beginning of my period time there and then you saw the end of my time there and uh, I've put in a little list of when I went back some of the things probably not every time but I've tried to do it so 1979 and this is what was described in the chapter called the glorious return the BBC paid for me to go back um, to help them make a film. They were making a series of 15 films called Inside Japan and they made one called The Chrysanthemum People which was number one because they thought this community offered a model for Japanese social life and it's got all the relationships between the little groups in the village, how they all work and so on. So that's, that's uh, I don't think it's available easily to access but I did discover that they have it in the archive at the BBC and, and I have got a copy and I recently met um, the director of that film um, who uh, I, I'm in touch with. So that was wonderful, that was a great return and actually uh, we, had a, we, had a, we had a really good time because everybody loved being filmed. The sad thing and this is a bit about the, the betrayal which I wrote in the chapter is that of course they filmed for 11 hours and the film was 50 minutes so lots of people who thought they were going to be in the film didn't make it so i hope this hasn't happened this time i've sent the film james and nadine made back and they people seem positive about it but we'll see uh in 1981 when i went back with my children um one time i was working on childcare in japan and i went with my children and i'm going to show you a picture of that in a minute i'm just going to nip through these because i've got pictures 86, 87, I went back again with my children um, and I went back again. I, I started writing a textbook about Japan, understanding Japanese society. And every time I updated the book, I went back to update it. 2001, and I'm gonna show you pictures of this too. I went back to buy wood for a Japan room that Oxford Brooks agreed to build. And um, you met the carpenter in the film who was building a fence at the time, and you'll see him shortly in Oxford. Um, I went back in 2011, just before the disaster happened, so nothing had happened in Tohoku at that time, and they'd built the new village hall, so they had a great party, the village hall. And those are two of my friends who, who were there at the time. You might recognize that lady from the film. <clears throat> and uh, in 2014, I was passing nearby, I was doing something else with the BBC actually, and I was passing nearby and I managed by chance to discover that they were holding the festival which I'd missed back in 1975, so that was a fun visit. 2017 textbook again, and of course, as you all know, 2019. So just a few pictures and then I'll let you uh, ask questions and make comments. So two, in 1981, I went back with my children. So there is James who made the film and some people who they were filming last year remembered this small boy that had come and potted about, a, that's him age four and we went back again when he was 10. Um, and there he is making friends with a local boy catching Zarigani, those of you who have lived and know Japan or Japanese people will know what Zarigani are. They're crayfish and they swim about in these little streams and there's the other one William who was one at the time taking a picture with my camera case <coughs> and playing with the granddads who spent a lot of time looking after the grandchildren in, in the shrine. In 1987 I went back with my children again <coughs> and it was a very sad visit because in 1981 we stayed with a family called the Barbars. In fact we only stayed with the granny who was there and the granddad 
um, because these children, he's a cousin, but these three daughters um, who invited me to Tanabata in 1975, and that's a picture taken then, lost their dad while I was there. It was really, really sad. It was a terrible time because he was 37 years old and he went out one day and fell down dead. And so that also is uh, one of the horrible things that happens. You get very close to people working in a village and then suddenly if someone dies, <clears throat> then you feel the loss as well as, uh, as you can. And, and I was being visited by my friends from Tokyo just at that time. So it was a real dilemma. How do I, how do I warn these people at the same time as welcoming my friends? So it's another of the difficulties. Anyway, that was the Barber House, which gradually fell into disrepair after, oh, sorry, 1987 was very sad because Granny Barber died that year. And she was in hospital when we were there and we went to visit her and my sons remembered her from before, especially James. <clears throat> um, and that's 2011 and the house was just standing there. However, good news is that the two brothers of the man who died put money into the new village hall and um, we had a lovely party there. I'll come to you in a minute. So 2011, the, um, was the visit when I went to buy wood to build a lovely Japanese room at Oxford Brooks. And here's a picture of Kawaguchi Kiyotoshi, who was in the film, and his son Yuki, and my student Bruce White, who happened to speak the local dialect, because he'd also worked there, having a drink in the pub in Oxford, or near Oxford. There's the room that they built. Um, you can see the outside of it here. I'll show you the inside in a minute. But that was the exciting opening ceremony because the Japanese ambassador came and there's the vice chancellor and they loved having this Japanese room. There's the inside and that beautiful hanging scroll was given to us by, um, maybe you recognize Mihoko who was in the film showing us her greenhouses with the chrysanthemums. Her father gave me that hanging scroll and it, in case you can't read it, it says, um, uh, Geido Mugen, which means the way of arts is infinite. And it's a beautiful thing to have in our, in our Japanese room. That's Mihoko who came to visit us with her husband and her daughter who studied um, English in the Isle of Wight. And I don't know whether they contacted, I'll find out about this later. That's another uh, present we received from the village for the room, which is a beautiful wedding kimono from a lady who used to make kimono. And there's James again, taking a picture of uh, the person who's trying it on there. Uh, in 2011, when I went back, I happened to arrive on the day of the funeral of the Kumagai granny, who I'd also known. And so there I just arrived and they said, come on in, it was granny and you know her. And <clears throat> Of course, I had to go and take part. And then they said, would you please sleep by the granny's ashes because she'll be lonely. So there's my bed. And there's Mutsuko again and the Kumagai, who you've already met. <clears throat> um, in 2011, I was doing some research there. Well, I won't bore you with these details, but it was quite a nice picture. That, that's the family that you saw, met the grandchildren of in the film. That's the daughter who, it said Suki Nogyo, because she was commuting to work with them, but she lived in a different house, and one of the, one of the grandchildren. And, but they came home for things like festivals, and this was a girl's day. <clears throat> this family, um, the, this man was the head of the village at the time, and he organized a wonderful part. They, they were still living at home in that generation, that's why it says that. And they organized a wonderful party in the new village hall where I had to sit in this horrible chair <laughs> at the top and talk to everybody. Uh, there's, I've actually got, I don't know if you can see this book, but they made a lovely book with all the, um, the people gathered for my uh, talk, which was awful. Um, and uh, yeah, there we are. Yes, and I thought at that time, of a wonderful thing to say when I was invited. They say, here is Professor Henry. And I said, I might be a professor in the UK, but I shall always be a student <laughs> in Japan because I'm always learning from these people. Um, so i uh, nearly finished and then you can ask questions. In fact, I have finished. Um, thank you very much. Wait, I have something else to say though before we go back to you, David. I can come back out of the chair, I think. Right. <clears throat> So I just want to say a little bit about the film. Um, despite the title of the film, Understanding Japanese Culture, it's not supposed to be an explanation of Japanese culture, 
but an explanation of how one might go about studying in Japan. And then translating the findings into a book and articles, probably far too many in my case, I'm a bit of a one for writing, <coughs> where I hope I presented as much as I learned about understanding Japan. So the understanding, at least mine, is all out there. Um, and now you have some of the behind the scenes secrets. This was a low budget um, family affair making this film. The Daiwa Foundation kindly covered my visit, but James and Nadine agreed to come much later. They were traveling in the Far East at the time and we had a lot of fun, but no professional backup. So please take that into consideration when looking at the film. And we do plan, we did plan an upgrade of the film, but I think its release coinciding with the pandemic meant that it's been seen much more widely than we attend, intended at that stage. Um, and we still might do an upgrade though. Uh, so here is your chance to ask questions and offer comments. So thank you for your attention and um, I'll go back to you, David. Well, thank you very much, Joy, for that fascinating overview. I certainly think that these long-term investigations are really one of the greatest strengths of, of, of social anthropology today. Now, let, 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 let's, go, let's go straight to, to questions. And we have one here from an anonymous attendee, which is fine. And our anonymous uh, colleague says, if you could go back to the start of your research, knowing what you do today, how would you have uh, gone about your research differently? Well, <clears throat> there's only one thing which I've written in, in the book as well, uh, but I don't think it would have been possible. It, I, would, I lived in a house over the border in another uh, Baraku, another community, and I got very close to my neighbors, the Kuma guys, which was wonderful. And as I explained in the film, they knew the people in my village very well, so it was fine. But the only thing that it would have been, I think, greater benefit would have been if I'd lived inside that village, so I didn't have to go out and come back all the time. But now the Kuma guys live on the border of the village, so I can walk out of the door and around. And so that's that's the only thing. I I I'm not too upset with what what happened. I I'd like to have kept um, in touch better than I did, but well, you saw you saw how in touch I was. Um, Indeed, indeed. Can and, I just and ask Emma, sorry, David, can I just ask Emma, because she's letting Nadine in, but if she could let James in as well, that would be good, because if he's there. Hey there, Joy. Hello, I'm here. Hi. I've let Nadine in. Are you sure they're not coming in from the same computer? Oh, perhaps they are. Perhaps they are. Okay. Yeah, I'll change the name now. Okay. Doesn't matter, you can leave it. And, and there's another excellent question here, which is, uh, can you give oh, any more... Uh, splendid. Right. Could you give any more incidents of, of temporary social banishment of the kind that you described with regard to the chap who started making paper? No, I, 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 the Murahachibu. I yes. don't know um, of any other cases. It's the only one that I had any experience at all of. I've only read about them in Japanese descriptions of rural life. I mean, I, mm -hmm. at the time when I worked there, I read a lot of folklore, Japanese folklore, because that's what there was available. There were only, I think, four anthropologists who'd worked in rural Japan before. And um, I read all their work, of course. In fact, I was in touch with all of them and they were very helpful. But otherwise, I read about it in, in Japanese folklore. Oh, I see. So it wasn't something that the village every year kind of reaffirmed the possibility of in some no. kind of ritual. Oh, no, it, it was a really big thing because there were 30 houses making paper by hand in that village. And mm -hmm. the Kumagai uh, family opened up a factory and started making paper by machine. So that was the big, that was a huge change. It was a bit of industrialization in, in the village. Actually, you've got in the audience there, uh, two members of the Kumagai family. You've got uh, Sushi, <laughs> Dr. Kumagai, Sushi Kumagai, and his sister Mutsuko Kawai. So if, they've, if you see them raising their hands, they might like to comment. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, there's a there's a chap here, Christopher Hood, who would like to answer his question live, okay. uh, which, which is fine. Now, uh, Emma, can you can you allow Christopher Hood to ask his question live, or Hanin? I have done so. So, Christopher, you need to unmute yourself to speak. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. 
Excellent. Uh, Joy, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this. And it was a brilliantly put together um, video as well, which I really enjoyed uh, watching. I sort of got two questions, if mm. I may. First one is, do you think it's possible for people these days to do the sort of research that you did, given the sort of ethical constraints and so on that people have to go through? And secondly, how one thing that I didn't see during the video and you didn't really touch on um, in the presentation is how and where did the concept of rapping culture come along? Was it during your visit here? As you know, the rapping culture concept has influenced me so much with my research. So I, I'm desperate to know a little bit more about this. Um, <clears throat> I, I think it would be quite difficult to do the kind of research I did now. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I support, I've retired, I retired, was retired off 10 years ago. And so I haven't been supervising students who have to go through the process um, of uh, um, ethical uh, considerations since then. But every one of my students who went to do field work in Japan went through it and we explained what they were doing and we discussed how they would go about it. And I think they did what they needed to do uh, as well as they could. What I think I probably couldn't do now is go to the city hall and get access to all the records of the families. Because in those days, uh, my professor, Professor Matsunaga came with me and they said, you've got, and this is in the book, actually, you've got three, you've got to uh, comply with three um, uh, regulations. One is you've got to have permission from your supervisor. So Matsunaga got that and you got it stamped by the university. Number two is you've got to get every house to agree. So they all signed and, well, stamped actually, used the household stamp. Um, and then the third is you've got to use their names in your publications. So you won't find the names of the people in that chart I gave them back in my publications. But now they've got it back, so <laughs> it's up to them. So that's, that, that's what I think would be different. I, I don't think you could do that. But I think otherwise, you know, I've been going back. I've been going through ethical considerations all these years. I don't think I did anything unethical. Uh, I didn't mean just the ethical. I just think, wonder whether there are certain whether the nature of developing relationships and how it works is differently also these days. I mean, Oh, sure. Sure, sure. I, I, should, I meant to mention this before. There were no, the only telephone I had in my house was a, called a U-Sendenwa, so it was a telephone with lines, and I could ring anybody in the community and they could ring me in any house because it called your number out. To make a, a call, an international call was really hard. So the only communication I had with the outside world was a letter once a week from my mum and dad. Likewise, when I came home, the only communication I had with the village was letters. And several people wrote to me, which was great, and I wrote back, but that was the only way we could keep in touch. I can, even now, many people in that village do not have internet access, and I can only email a couple of them. Um, I did call them after the film was finished, and I've spoken to various people, but it's still quite difficult. So now, because people can get access and communicate with each other, especially if they're younger than people that I'm talking to in the village, and they're not farmers who don't have internet access, um, you can carry on being in touch with people. And it's, it's quite, I'd say that was a big difference too. And in terms of the rapping culture? Oh, sorry, rapping culture, yes. <clears throat> no, that came later, much later, when I started looking at politeness as a subject. When I, I was a student at the time, right? And I went back, I came back, wrote my thesis. I went back to the study of child rearing. And I have a very good friend called Takako Shimagami, who's not here because she's a psychiatrist and very busy advising people at the moment. <clears throat> but she um, said to me, Joy, your language is not proper for a person who's teaching at a university. Study it and do better. So I did a whole study on politeness. And during that time, decided that rapping was an important phenomenon and that's when that developed. But I have to say that my son William, who I think is also here, um, said I should have pointed it out when I came out of the place in Yame City where they're now making crafts to show to the public as a kind of cultural display that they used to make in the village <coughs> for their everyday lives. <coughs> so um, there, that, that's an example of seeing things wrapped for the general public, present, presented, because it was wrapping politeness, presentation and power was the title of the book. That's great, so, wonderful. No, the answer is no, really. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Joy. Well, thank you very much. We, we, have, we have a um, 
uh, another live question here from 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 a um, a colleague called Chiba Keiko. I don't know Hi. whether um, you could make her live, please, Hanin. Yes. Hi. 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 Hi, good fan. Hi, Joy. Hi, uh, may I ask a question? Of course. Lovely. It was lovely to see your film um, with our family, and um, we we were wondering that. Um, did when you do asking at interviews, um, did you feel that they're telling what they want you to hear? Um, what they perceive it's a good kind of family line, or um, did you feel that they actually telling the real stories? For example, um, you know, in Japanese society. Divorce is illegitimate to children, or something like that. Is right. so quite right. and when you're considering Hon and Tatemai, um, did you later on when you come back to the village, did you find out more details, or later on, um, if you can describe it more later? Right. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question, and of yes. course, um, it's one of the advantages of being an anthropologist as opposed to somebody who goes in for a shorter period. I was there for a year. And I have a very good example I used to tell my students of how on the first day when I said I'm looking at Renai and <clears throat> Miai, different kinds of marriage, mm -hmm. the head of the village smiled at his wife and, and said, oh yes, Renai, yeah, we, 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 and, and he said, I understand you have that where you come from. And I said, yes. And then later on, I discovered that he refused to allow his own daughter to marry somebody she claimed to have fallen in love with. And even later on, I heard him saying, I think these love marriages are very dangerous. So staying for a year and spending time sitting and listening rather than asking questions is I think one of the things that only we anthropologists can do because we have time to get to know people and be there. And of course, I discovered that um, these, these things that people say might be what they want you to hear. But by staying long enough and listening, you, you do get behind, you do get more of the honne, I think. I mean, that's what I think. And I'd just like to finish that story by telling you that the, the daughter of the head of the village was very clever because she got um, a, a respected uncle to present her and her lover to the father as if they'd never met. So the father agreed to their wedding. <laughs> <He's> got, <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely story. Okay, got you. Thank you so much indeed, Joy. Thank you for your question and Thank your you. hospitality. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. And now we have another, another live question, this time from Rachel Marie. And I'm afraid I don't know how to pronounce your surname, but please go ahead, Rachel Marie. I don't see her or oh, hear her. Is, is Rachel no Rachel, longer? Rachel, you are currently muted. You need to unmute yourself to speak. There should be a little microphone. Well, while I'm waiting for you to get Rachel, can I just say welcome to, I've been introducing anthropology to Scottish schools and I understand amongst the audience there is Linda Corin Bockers who teaches anthropology and some of your students. So welcome, it's really nice to have you here. Well, just, just, just don't worry if we've lost Rachel, perhaps she'll come back later. But there's a, a question here from, from, from Jocelyn uh, Murgatroyd, and, and she asks about the relationship between urban and rural culture, saying, uh, do you think the differences between the village and the capital Tokyo were greater then or are they greater now? Oh, very interesting. <clears throat> well, they are certainly quite great. Um, and in those days, the young people in the village used to go away, they'd go to Osaka um, and they'd spend, maybe spend a year working there. And many of them came back because they didn't like city life. Uh, it's a difficult question for me to answer because I stayed there for a year that time. I'd been back for longer periods. I lived in Tokyo on different occasions, but all this was many years ago. And I'm afraid I can't, I don't, mm -hmm. Various things have changed. It would take me a long time to talk it through with you, but I suspect that it's perhaps less different now because I certainly know that people in cities are going, trying to find places in the country where they can settle because they can be in touch with their work as we are now with um, uh, remote access. And so maybe the country is being influenced. Sorry, I can't really answer that question. 
Ah, well, well, that, 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 <laughs> well, obviously, it's, obviously, it was, a, it was, it was a, a, a very good one, in, in, indeed. And um, now we have one from a student. Uh, M asks, uh, asks uh, um, um, I am an anthropology student, and I was struck by what you wore. Did what you wear change over time spent in village, in the village? Uh, because, of course, you had multiple and in, in, in different kinds of social relations with them. Uh, did you have to dress in any way that meant that one group favoured you more than another group? And, uh, and she was wondering, indeed, whether you uh, uh, changed after you got to the village, as distinct from the sort of clothes you might wear if you were passing through Tokyo. Okay. <clears throat> you mean if I wore different things in Tokyo as opposed to in the country? Yes, and whether you changed your clothes in the village at all, or, 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 or how, much, how much was dress significant in your relations with the villagers? Well, I used to wear dress very casually because people were dressed casually for their everyday lives. But if I were invited to a wedding, which I often was, because every single wedding that happened while I was there, I was invited to because they knew that's what I was doing, looking at, I was interested in. Of course, I dressed up for a wedding and didn't dress in a kimono because I don't know how to do that. And I never, I, people have dressed me in kimono, but it's not something I do. <clears throat> so I would dress up and try to look as smart as I could. Hmm. I see. Oh, and then our, our good friend and colleague, Rene Hirschhorn. Hello, Rene, asks a question and says, um, is this that- um, Hi, Rene. Yeah. Uh, she said that, 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 that she, she felt that, that becoming a neighbor was absolutely the crucial thing in, in, in setting up good relations with people. Uh, and and, and, and would, would you agree with that? Definitely. I mean, you saw in the film that my neighbors, the Kuma guys, were my clo the closest people that I knew. And it was with their family that I stayed and lived after the house that I was living in with Dennis, after he'd gone back and the house was broken into, they invited me to stay with them. And the first time I met, Professor Matsunaga introduced me to all sorts of important people, head of the village, head of the city, different people, owner of our house but he didn't introduce me to my neighbor. And so I went around and I said, um, <clears throat> how do I get rid of my rubbish? Because nobody had told me how to do this. So my neighbor told me about getting rid of the rubbish. He also said, this was Mr. Kumagai, Hiroku, who I stayed with and you saw in the film. Um, he said, it's also a good idea if you're coming to live here to take a small present round to all the people in our little neighborhood and say who you are and what you're doing here. So that's exactly what I did. Thank you for the question, because in Japan, it is really important. And I've met many people who've come back from living in Japan and said they never got to know their neighbors. And I say, well, did you introduce yourself to them? So it was, yeah, absolutely crucial. And thank you, it was a good mm. and, and related to that, there's an, another, actually, I think, a question that goes to quite to the to the heart of much anthropological theory. When a, a, a one of our um, listeners says, "When you wrote down the lineages, did you have a sense that you were writing them down, or the villagers themselves already had an idea of their lineage?" So, so did you create the lineage for them, as it were, or was it already there? Good. good. Well, of course, that's a very good anthropological question. Um, I uh, did it with them. And I've written about it in some detail in the book, that how we did it, because the old, the old members of the house who were no longer doing the farm work loved to sit down and talk about their uh, ancestors and their Buddhist altar, which is where you remember the ancestors. Um, and they especially loved the fact that I could remember their complicated names, which nobody else could. I mean, I, as an anthropologist, you need to do these things. So it was definitely a joint effort. And of course, all those people are now dead, but the people who, the, their children and grandchildren are the people who received the, the, the uh, family trees that I took and the huge chart of the whole village. I did the chart of the whole village. That was an anthropological exercise because I wanted to see who was related to everybody else. In that village, 30 houses were called Kawaguchi, but they weren't all related. And I think 15, no, that's not right. There were a number that were called Shibata and they were related. So there were those kinds of considerations. But um, the people you saw in the film accepting the papers in the village hall at the end were in the youth group when I was there first. So <clears throat> they'd all seen me come through and, and they could, they could, they knew how I worked, probably, if they took any notice, but it was definitely a joint effort. 
and, and working with what, how they wanted to present themselves. And I can put you on to more things I've written about that if necessary. <clears throat> yes, well, that, that's fascinating. And, and related to that, there was a, there's, a, there's somebody who's written in uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a Japanese person, and, and uh, they say, how did you go about solving the problem of representing the village worldview in the in the way that you uh, uh, and the way that you might incorporate this in in your presentation in in, in the film, uh, for example, and and she said, did you experience a level of stress when you were trying to bring out the worldview of the villagers, and how did you go about uh, 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 getting over this potential problem? Mm. You mean in the film we just made? Yes, but I'm sure that you could uh, um, generalize it to the to other other points of the ethnographic. Okay. I would like to say that the film I just made with Nadine and James, I had two very uh, good filmmakers. So Nadine had the most amazing smile and she'd never met these people before and they would open their doors and there would be Nadine behind the camera saying, and she didn't speak much Japanese, but she learned enough to get on the good side of them. And she would say, Konnichiwa, and people would just immediately smile. And when I explained that the man with her, James, was my son who they'd seen twice as a boy, it was very easy. So that film, I don't think, I mean, we had some stress between us sometimes as mothers and children might, but I don't think the villagers found it stressful to have us there. When the BBC came to make a film, on the other hand, um, and they definitely wanted to present the worldview of this village as a model for Japanese rela relations, we did have some stress. And that's another thing I've written about in the book because um, uh, I was really worried that I was upsetting people. They were wonderfully professional about appearing as if they were doing everything normally when they were being filmed. <clears throat> the camera crew was fantastic. The, the cameraman has gone on to work with Michael Palin. The director uh, has made lots of other anthropological films. So I was, guess I was lucky then too. But there was one morning when they'd encouraged us to come at 6 a.m. to film something they were doing, some preparation of land. And when we got there, and as you can imagine, the BBC crew, the four of them, were a bit worried about having to get up so early, but they arrived at 6 a.m. and we went to the field and they'd finished. <laughs> they said, we, oh, sorry, we, we started at five. And I never knew whether they'd started at five because they were fed up with being filmed or whether they, it was uh, probably my mistake, but <clears throat> I don't think it was. But anyway, before we left, they had a wonderful party and we all left in, in, on, on good terms. But I think it is quite stressful. And um, doing field work like this is stressful as i said earlier you it's great excitement it's something that you're finding out it's really good but you're always nervous you don't want to upset people and one of the reasons i decided to take back the things to the village that i had in my study is because i didn't want them to be lying about and not be belong to the people who'd given them to me so that was for me it was great it was a relief to be able to give things back to people who'd helped me so much <clears throat> Mm. Uh, thank you. These are all absolutely fascinating. Now we have a, 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 a colleague in, in Chicago, uh, Julia Thomas, uh, and she said, congratulations on a wonderful film, but could you reflect on how anthropology and anthropological fieldwork has changed since the 1970s? And she says, it seems to me that anthropology has moved away from fieldwork to theory heavy work that is self-reflective and often says little about the people different from themselves. What do you think about that? Can you ask her if she's Julia? Is she Julia Adene, Thomas? Uh, I'm afraid I don't have that. Um, oh, okay. Ability. She's but a good friend. She's a historian in Chicago. Historian, yeah, she'll be that. So that's, thank you, that's a very good question. And I think you're probably right. And we do all do field work, as far as I know. Look, I've been retired, as I said before, for 10 years. I've been taking anthropology to Scottish schools, which is great but I'm not working with um, the uh, university environment that I came out of, <clears throat> but I was hoping to go to the Association of Social Anthropologists conference this year in St. Andrews and the RAI conference in London. And of course we can't do those things. So I try to keep up the IUAES, the International Association is a good place to keep up, but I've moved into thinking about anthropology and education. And I think a lot of anthropology is very highly theoretical, too theoretical for ordinary everyday people to understand. So I'm actually working against 
that where I can in order to write and the book which I have just completed called An Affair with the Village has gone to a trade publisher which promises to do me 40,000 words and 60 colour photographs for 10.99. 9.99 it might even have been. What academic book can you buy <laughs> full of theory for that? So thanks Julia, nice question. <laughs> yes and, and she writes saying yes it is, it is me. She says. Oh great, thank you. So, That's so, nice yeah. to have your question. <laughs> There we are. And another kind of related, a related question is, is, do you think as a field worker you, you had any impact on the lives of the village or, or was your presence completely neutral? Well, I, I, it's a very difficult question, isn't it? I, I don't think, I did have a, much of an influence on the lives of the villagers. Um, I mean, they, did, they do make, they do remember me, as you saw in the picture that they brought out that was in the village hall and they did have a party when I went back in 2011 to celebrate the new village hall but <clears throat> I don't think I've influenced their lives. I'm not sure about the Kuma guys and if one of the Kuma guys who was sitting there would like to speak that would be wonderful because I may have changed their lives a little bit. I lived in their house and Mutsuko who in the film pointed out the room where she used to do her schoolwork was the very first person to come to visit me back in the UK. And she happened to arrive when I was moving from Oxford to Scotland. So she visited me in Oxford and Scotland. And uh, Atsushi Kumagai, who is uh, Dr. Kumagai, who's also there, um, came to visit us in Scotland and uh, with his wife and, and little boy who you saw in the film. Well, the little boy didn't come to Scotland, but his wife did. It was before he was born. So I'm possibly, may have influenced them somehow, they, they would have to answer themselves. Oh, yes, I see. Well, I see that we've only got five minutes left and I, you wanted your son to say something, didn't you? But we've got a if question. If you want to, up to yeah. him. But I just wanted to say, whilst he's thinking about that, that we've got a, a nice sort of question to begin to wind things down on from Leila Kikuchi House, when she says, how, how did you uh, get into anthropology in the first place? And what did you want to get out of anthropology when you began? Was Japan your aim or, or could it have been some other country? Oh, okay. Well, um, I had never heard of anthropology when I was a student. I discovered it when I was living in Mexico, being a journalist. Once I discovered it, I never looked back. It, and I'm actually working on another autobiographical book called uh, Tales from the Life of an Anthropologist, in which you will be able to discover that I think I probably started being one age three and you would be able to read why and where, which was in the middle of Warwickshire. Um, I could have done my anthropology elsewhere. With Dennis, my husband, we'd sat in a pub and discussed, shall we go to Japan or shall we go to uh, South America, to the, the, the um, rainforest of South America, because that's where my supervisor had worked, and we hit on Japan. So that's, so, so the answer is I could have done it elsewhere, and it's, been my lifetime activity ever since I discovered it. Uh, I, I, I see. Um, there's a, a teacher from, from America, Tia Murchie Bayman, and she says, uh, has there been any uh, change in the use of family shrines at home? And she says it's early in the morning, so she's very happy to have her question read out. <laughs> um, not that I noticed. I mean, the people who uh, I always visit if she's talking about the Buddhist altars or she's talking about the Shinto Kami Well, the, one, the ones where, where I think where family people are shown, because she says, yeah. for example, is there now more representation from the mother's side of the family? Oh, okay. Well, it will depend on how that Buddhist altar has come into the house. So in the continuing families that I'm talking about in the village, um, they, they make uh, offerings quite often daily to the people who've died in previous generations. In cities, <clears throat> so my friend Yasuro, who you met at the beginning and with whom I, I stayed, uh, I stay whenever I'm in Tokyo and James and Nadine stayed in Tokyo this time. He has the little Buddhist altar. Um, uh, the, he remembers his family in his own house in Tokyo in a cupboard. And many other people have the Buddhist altar in their, for their families in, in a cupboard. So they don't have it out in the open and give offerings every day. It's a different way of doing things. So yeah, I think it has changed. And I think it varies from one family to another and depending on their relationships. If you happen to live 
in Tokyo in a continuing family house, so with your parents above you or below you, you're often above if you're the younger family. Um, it might be with a mother's family as well as a father's family, in which case I dare say it would pass. It's a really complicated question. Um, <clears throat> I've written about it, so you could look it up somewhere if you, if you want to know the answer. Uh -huh. Well, I see that we only have two minutes left. Uh, um, is uh, is uh, the filmmaker uh, on the line? Would he like to make a couple of comments about making ethnographic film? Do you want to say anything, James, about making the film? Well, we didn't have anything to say. We're just here to answer questions, if there were any. <laughs> so somebody asked, what was it like making an ethnographic film? You've gone off the screen slightly. What was it like? For, for us, it was a bit of a moral dilemma because we've got quite strong feelings about Japan, um, how they use way too much plastic for everything. And I just think it's, um, I think, and just the, the overall kind of um, interpretation of um, anthropology and how it's used in, in the world. And just, I'm not really sure. I, I just, I think we, we were in a moral dilemma, but I think the point was to show people how, um, how, how an anthropologist does their field work, and that's what we tried to convey. Thank but you. We, but but we, 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 we were very uncomfortable with... I think one thing I'd like to say is, like, village life is very similar wherever you go in the world. So although Japanese culture is different, especially from a Western perspective, and I'm always someone who wanted to visit Japan, so it was very eye-opening for me, but what I realized is village life is very, very similar wherever you go. Um, so yeah, I thought that was interesting. And Midsummer uh, Murders. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank, it, thank it, you very much. It's great. But, but I'd still but I'd like to say one more thing that I think what sure. was very sad is that what your what isn't being thought about here is the journey that's happened and this loss of traditional culture and then this influence of whatever this modern culture is that we're living and the fact that everybody, we all felt ill during the process of being in the village for two weeks because everybody was spraying a large amount of pesticides. And we saw, you know, the kind of containers that they're up for these, you know, piles and piles of these pesticide containers. People get sick and die a lot younger than they used to. They used to have very healthy diets. They now don't. Um, and it just seemed to me that there's something very sad underlying this whole story of this uh, loss of tradition for... <laughs> Well, I'm not. What well, I'm not sure, and we've definitely here. We are in COVID, all having to face the fact that we've um, really done something very strange to our societies, to our perception of reality, our link with nature, and how we treat the planet. And so here we all are, and I think we should be thinking about that. And the example of Japan is quite frightening in many regards, and we've all had to like. Um, Face that recently and I think we should be thinking about how we behave. I, did, I, did, I personally encourage everyone to start their own personal food forest, turn your gardens into... <laughs> all right, all right. Well, well thank you very much. Joy, but, the, 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 the last um, word should be yours, Joy. You, 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 you finish well, I, the, they, they made a wonderful film. They're a company called Leaf of Life and uh, that's what they make films about as well. So anyone who's interested <laughs> can easily follow that up by going to the link on the film. And David, do we have to stop? You've got fifty-five more questions there. I have, but uh, we, but we, but um, uh, we're, we're 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 scheduled to stop at this time. I mean, I, I don't know what you think. Um, uh, the, what does the technical team think, Hanin and um, Emma? Hi, David. Uh, how should Hello. we do this? I mean, there's no um, need. It, or is there? No, no, it won't cut us off. If you want to carry on answering a few more questions, I don't mind. If I just see all those people waiting who've asked a question, including David Hughes, who's got his hand raised. Yeah, I was going to say we have uh, David Hughes. He might want to bring in a live question. Go, go, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Apparently, okay. fifty-five uh, questions waiting. Please, David, if you unmute yourself, okay, you can ask your question. Let's see. Am I unmuted? Yes, we hear you. Oh, this is weird. Well, let me just say we loved Gina, and I just loved watching the forty-five minute film. My question relates to my experience back in 1977, my first field uh, trip to Japan to research traditional folk song. And for Joy as well, in those days, there weren't many foreigners going into the countryside, I think. Uh, now, if I go into a, a little village somewhere, I'm not as weird and unique as I used to be. I wonder if Joy has noticed in her experience and others of you, uh, how life has changed for foreign researchers since the 70s 
and you know whether you're still having an interesting impact on them or freaking somebody out or uh, what's what's different for you over these 45 yeah, years yeah no it's it's um it's completely different when i was living there in 1975 i was the only well dennis and i were the only foreigners in the whole of the city of yemen which was uh, quite a large area the, the the village was just one small part and so one day somebody phoned me up and said there's another foreigner in Yame. would you <laughs> like to speak to them <laughs> so um so i did and and, and we had a chat but <clears throat> um since then of course many people have gone to teach english in japan and there are lots of english teachers around so they're much more used to foreigners and oh and the lady fell off her bike one day because I was on my bicycle and Dennis was running, having a run beside me. And she saw this woman on a bike and a man running and just freaked her out. <laughs> so that, that kind of thing happened in those days. Whereas now there are lots of foreigners and the children in the film who said, my name is, you know, Shibata, whatever it was. Um, I think they have an English teacher in their school, of course. Most schools do. So there are lots of, so I'm not a freak anymore. I'm just their, <laughs> their personal freak. <laughs> and people don't say anymore, you know, what happens over there, as if over there was all one place. So there's, yeah, huge difference. <clears throat> Turns out I can see some of these questions here. I can't answer them immediately, but... Oh, okay, here's one I'd like to answer, if I may. Go Somebody ahead. Said, Why do we not hear the voices of the people in the film? Because that's a very good question. Um, the, the film that we had with... Um, the BBC, it was all the voices of the people in the village, and we translated and put subtitles underneath. No, we didn't. That's not right. We, uh, I translated them all, and then they recorded the English with a Japanese accent from actors. Um, in this film, we didn't have, we don't have, didn't have the resources to put subtitles in for people speaking Japanese. So I would have had to translate what was being said. And in fact, uh, it would have been nice to have more Japanese voices. It was one of the comments that Peter Bicknell and Maggie Bicknell made when they watched. Did I thank them? Because they made, they were a couple of our editorial advisors. <clears throat> but we, um, uh, so we do have voices, but it wasn't possible to put them in. So what I might do in the future, if I can raise the funds to do this, is to get James to make a diff slightly different film with subtitles in Japanese for the English and English for the Japanese, so that it can be more easily shared between um, uh, ourselves and um, the Japanese people I worked with. So I hope anonymous attendee is happy with that answer. Thank you. Oh, but uh, I see that David Gallery, if David is still with us, perhaps you could uh, allow David, David to ask his question live. Yeah, of yes, you should be able to speak, David, if you unmute yourself. If you are still there. Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm there. I, 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 <laughs> so is Lola. Um, and we enjoyed the film very much. I don't have a question. I, I don't know how I got onto the list of questions. My question would have been the same, I think, about, um, uh, about the lack of voices in, in, in the film. Um, and it would have been nice to, to ask the villagers, you know, what did they make of this strange foreigner when she, when she first arrived? What did they think of her then? Did they, do they remember what they thought of her then when she first came? Oh, okay. Thanks, David. Um, <clears throat> we have, over the years, talked about this with them. I mean, it's one of the things people talk and laugh about. And in the film, there's a film I showed at the end of my presentation just now a party that happened in 2011 when they built the new village hall. And there's a man who lives in the village who has a video camera and he made a film of the, me presenting to them and the people there. And it was one of the things that was being discussed at the time, what it was like to have this strange foreigner in the village. So, um, yeah, we did we talk about it. And people <laughs> may or may not tell the truth about what they really think, as Chiba Kaika Sam pointed out earlier. But, um, and somebody down, oh, David is asking, was I the first non-Japanese, <clears throat> David Hughes? Um, and yes, I was, and they didn't. They have, yeah, we've had that question. As I attempted to move to Japan once, I've written about this in a book actually. I was invited to go and work in university, but I didn't go. Did I struggle with loneliness? Um, uh, yes, <clears throat> I was lonely at times, especially when Dennis went back. But yes, a friend from my mother's neighborhood came to stay over New Year, which was good. She was studying Japanese. 
and uh, that's the end. Oh yes, no, I had other friends. Later on, when I went with the children, a friend came to stay, Judy, a friend called Judy Skelton, and um, uh, that's all really. Hmm. And then and, Jason, uh, oh look, Jason's asking something. He's the man who's funded me. I'm wondering how the end of the social ostracized after cutting the relevant people off for a whole year, did the villagers and their families just return to being normal friends? That's what is supposed to happen, and apparently that's what happened. So, but uh, yeah, that's that's the that's. What so there was there was there was no meal, as it were, a drink or something like that. It was no ritual at all to mark the reincorporation. I don't know. Maybe maybe Doctor Kumagai, if he's there and willing to speak, could answer that question. Are you still there, Atsushi? It's quite late at night in Japan. Can you see him answering at all? Did he put his hand up? There he is. So there I. I have, just, him come. I have just allowed him to speak. He has yes. to still unmute himself if he's willing to speak. Okay, so Atsushi, if you unmute yourself, do you know the answer to the question about Murahachibu? Do you even know that it happened? You'd have to unmute yourself. Jibunde ana hanasu yori. Yep, dekita. Can you answer the question? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. So this is Atsushi from Japan. Um, uh, Henry-san, Henry uh, um, can I explain the meaning of Murahachibu? Please. Yeah. Mm, so Japanese culture, Japanese people's uh, atmosphere uh, virtually uh, want to be uniform and uh, uh, social pressure, uh, social pressure uh, tend to uniform each other. But um, if there is a uh, one person or one family, uh, if they, if he or she or they are not uniform uh, performance, uh, surrounding, surrounding uh, social people and people uh, want uh, uh, consider him or her as a not member of us. So it is, uh, is it a good explanation? Yes, but um, so um, when, when your father, when your fa grandfather's yes, family, was discriminated uh, yeah. against. Mm -hmm. At the end of the year, was yeah. there any kind of celebration that one year was finished? Do you know that? Maybe you don't know. Ah, but it is a very historical issue for me. Uh, so my my father's and the grandfather's company made a fire uh, at the, his uh, company. Yeah, uh, it was a living of Murahachibu at the time, but uh, I don't know the uh, situation at the time of one year later. Uh, do you know uh, that situation? Um, Mutsuko might know about that situation. Mutsuko, Mutsuko Kawaii, she's also yes, there. Kawaii. Yes, she is uh, older than me. Can you, can you see her, um, Emma? <clears throat> Mutsuko is the daughter of the Kumagai family. Hmm. Well, if we're, if we're waiting for that, I mean, do you want to ask another question, Joy? For example, there's one okay. here about, uh, was there anything that worried you when you first visited Japan, such as mispronouncing words or, or perhaps accidentally offending anybody? Yes, yes. Yes, I was always worried about accidentally offending people, especially when I was beginning to learn more about politeness. Um, they had a great local dialect in that um, area <clears throat> called Yameben, and um, I took a great delight in learning it because whenever I used words from it, um, the people would love it and they would laugh and uh, we would have a, um, a fine time. And the problem for me then was going back to Oxford where they put me in a class. Uh, I went to the Japanese um, undergraduate classes when I went back to keep my Japanese up and uh, made a few funny mistakes because I was using my local dialect. So definitely I worried all the time. But one thing that, um, and this might be interesting for other foreigners living in Japan, 
I don't know whether this is still the case, but in those days, whatever I did, they didn't care because they said, Gaijin Dakara, she's a foreigner. So that's why she does funny things. So it doesn't matter. Maybe now you have to be more careful, but um, so far I don't think I've upset people too much. Although I do have a friend who isn't here, the one who's a psychiatrist who I have been known to upset, but um, she and I are still good friends, so that's okay. <clears throat> Mutsuko-san seems to have undone her... Yeah. Um, oh, great. I was going to say, you can speak now, Mutsuko. Hello. 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 Yeah, we can hear you. Those are. Yeah. Hello, I'm glad to see you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't know. Sorry, we don't know people who've asked that question. Sorry. It's, it's two generations before Mutsuko san, so it's not really surprising, and maybe they don't talk about it too much. Nice. Thank you. Arigato gozaimasu. Domo domo. Doi tasumashite. Gomen nasai. Yakuni tatanakute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Arigato. Hanashite mo. Somebody else asking something. I can hear a voice. Well, there is a question here. Simply, what sparked the video retrospective um, project? Oh, okay. Well, it wasn't a video project. It was a project to take back materials I'd collected including the huge village um, <clears throat> chart and all the family trees so that they wouldn't be sitting in uh, my study in Oxford on top of a shelf, but they would be back with the people whose charts they were. Um, and then because Nadine and James were traveling in the area and they agreed to come to uh, join me there and they make films all the time, they agreed to make a film. So it was wonderful for me because I had the pleasure of their company, and we think we had quite a lot of fun. Well, that's good. That's good. That's good. Well, I th I think we probably have had a, a splendid discussion. Perhaps if there are if there are more questions, there will be some way that they could be sent to Joy, um, as it were. There, uh, yes, they're all here. So I suppose I could sit and answer some. Of course, of course, if you I if mean, you would like, I'm sure, sure we could provide you the emails if they're not um, obvious from the screen. They are. I've got them on the screen here, and it says "answer live" or "type answer." Ah, well, that's that's that that, that that's very we've good. Had, we've had the Morahachibu discussion. That's one of them. Um, what have you learned along the way as a result of this process? If your forty-five years were a visual document, okay, that's not easy to answer. Guven, I'll get back to you. <clears throat> Joyce, Jocelyn, have you been back? To where you were initially in Tokyo. Yes, of course, I go back every time. And um, oh, that you asked that one. The difference between village and, and then there's Linda Colin Box with her students. Um, are you the reason that um, my social anthropology students will be able to gain an insight into the work of an anthropologist? And you are the reason that they are able to study. Oh, that was just a comment. Thank you, Linda. Did you ever find out something about a family that made your relationship awkward with them? Yes, that's one of the things I did, did do. And I do discuss in a book uh, here and there in my writings. <clears throat> um, but it wasn't there. It was later on in a different place. Why do we not hear the voice of the people who've answered that? What made you want to study marriage in particular? Oh, that's a good one to answer. I was living in a house in Tokyo, the one I showed you a picture of, with six girls and six boys, all of us unmarried, and the girls <coughs> talked more about who they were going to marry than any other subject. So I thought that would be a good thing to study as an anthropologist, and I, I decided on that subject and went back to, um, to uh, study anthropology and build up a plan to do that. Why do why so many anthropologists did their field work in Noto? <laughs> in the days that I first went, Japanese anthropologists, of which there are many in many universities, Japanese students study anthropology, and the ones who are training, nowadays they often go abroad, but in those days they didn't have the funds to go abroad, so they did a lot of them did research in Japan in the country, 
like the Noto Peninsula, places where things were a bit different. And that's why they were a lot there at that time. There is a book which we have just accepted for the Japan Anthropology Workshop about field work in the Noto Peninsula now. So uh, look out for that one if you're interested. I was wondering if the, the community and its resilient histories are driving that to keep you coming back. No, I just go back because that's where I know a lot of people. And every time I go back, I visit the houses. Well, I used to visit the houses where someone had died and um, <clears throat> keep up the relations with the houses. It, a lot's changed recently, so there are new people I don't know. And it says, uh, the question asks, concerning the methodology of studying Japan, do you think it will change now that social media is a part of average life? Yes, is the answer to that. And I think I answered that already. Why the emphasis on kinship, asked somebody. Great way to meet people that work, to work so diligently. My kinship was not nearly so neat. Oh, because he worked in Thailand, it seems very old fashioned, but maybe it, I think it's old fashioned in Japan too, probably. People aren't so um, keen on it anymore, and, but they do take it into consideration, but there's been a lot published about that. Um, and they, people keep working on it and publishing it, so better read something more up to date. Wonderful film, and today I share this with my students. Thank you. Fabio Gigi, I wonder whether the decision to have you as the main narrator was conscious or had to do with technical limitations. I really enjoyed the film, but would have liked to hear what the Japanese participants were thinking about anthropology and being the subjects thereof. Good question, Fabio, well asked. <clears throat> well, I do have to make another film, James and Nadine. Um, Tamara Dragaji, lovely to see you join my days in Oxford some same time as you. We were told that what people answered to our questions and what they actually do was often different. Without living in the village, how did you get around this dilemma? I know you heard lots of times, but my memory fades. I might sell for difficulties of this sort, which is why I always felt I had to live in the place. Well, I was very close. I was going there every day and I did stay there. I got invited to stay there a lot. So I think I did, as I answered already, get to see what was the difference between what people said and what they did, which I know we discussed a lot in those days back in Oxford. Um, <clears throat> so, and as I said before, it was good to go back uh, again over the years and talk to people about changes. Have the changes in the role of traditional making practices, including the creation of a local museum presenting traditional skills, had any noticeable effects on the village descriptions of their ancestors? Ooh, good question. Um, I dare say it has, but I'm afraid I didn't ask about that too much. Um, hello, Joy, I'm grateful. I was only there for two weeks. The film was, James and Nadine and I were there for two weeks making the film. So it was quite a short period. Um, grateful for the opportunity. Oh yes, here's somebody who teaches the IB and wants to know how to discourage them from, oh, how to advise them for discouraging fieldwork in the extended essay. The only fieldwork allowed is the one that takes place in the internal assessment. Fieldwork, well, you are, show them the film, show what a good thing fieldwork is. <clears throat> Do you think that becoming part of the community allowed you to find out? Yes, of course. Oh, more than keeping your distance, of course. Of course, of course. By the way, I have been talking to people in the village over the last period and they said, we haven't got COVID-19 in Yame yet. It's around in Kurume, but it hasn't reached Yame. So um, we're being very careful, but they need to look after their chrysanthemums and they, they're doing their farm work. The man who you met in the film with the beautiful artworks around his house, who has a business, has had to put his business on hold. He's not able to carry on working. So in case you're interested in that, that's what's going on talking about keeping a distance. <clears throat> Were local lineages also documenting their own family trees? Um, some people did, <clears throat> especially the high ranking families. So in the next community where we were staying, when Dennis was with me, he had a student studying English herself and with her children. And they took out the family trees in their house to show me, but they were of a, quite a high ranking family. Comment on your reflections. I lived in a community Oh, it's Rene. Um, I was a day to day. Oh, yes, thank you, Rene. That's a good point. How did you learn Japanese? Would you consider yourself? Okay, so I studied in Tokyo at the Naganuma, uh, what was it called? Naganuma Tokyo Nipponga Gakko. Um, I did um, 
<clears throat> I did work there, but I learned much more in the village and I had to speak Japanese because nobody knew any English at all. Kumagai's um, that you have with us now, Mutsuko and Natsushi speak pretty good English, but in the village, nobody, but nobody knows enough, which is very sad and why I want to put subtitles on the film. Oh, you saw the children. They've learned a little bit. Um, and uh, fluent. Well, I do my best, but as I said at the end of the film, um, because I'm getting old and not that much, I'm losing it. So that's the answer to that. Susan, thank you for a wonderful talk. You mentioned betrayal and infidelity and gave us an idea of what you mean by betrayal. Does infidelity refer to your engagement with your other aspects or areas of Japan or to something different? Yes, partly, because <clears throat> I went to work in other parts of Japan and other aspects of Japan which you feel remain understudied more. Looks like you're going to have to invite me to talk at the Daiwa Foundation because <laughs> that a, needs a big answer. If Susan's still there, I'm willing. Susan Meehan, thank you for your question. And, um, and I've written about the infidelity and have, that's in the book, which you guys have, uh, shall receive. Have you noticed any changes over time regarding the comparison of or use of family shrines? Oh, you have done that one. I'm willing to know that you've asked those rural Japanese villages regarding current smoke. We have just told you about COVID-19. Uh, Andrea, thank you very much for this and for making the documentary. I would like to ask two questions. <clears throat> making a documentary was, I presume, a relatively new experience for you. I'm not aware of any others that you made, but maybe could you tell us a bit more about how you had the idea about making the documentary? Okay, that idea was because my son makes films and he was willing to come and do it. And uh, <clears throat> so it was his idea and he and my other son did quite a lot of the editing along with Nadine, of course. Um, <clears throat> so you'll need to ask them. There's a question for you at last, Nadine and James. Sort of related to the previous question, but how did the people react to the camera or to you with the camera? Did it change your relationship and affairs in any way? Well, I think I've answered that one too um, and said that <clears throat> we had very good filmmakers. So, oh. Oh, there she is. There's Nadine. So, do you hear yeah. the question? Yeah. Um, I think nowadays people aren't really that afraid of cameras. I mean, people seem to want to be on camera, if anything. And because you had joy, you have a good relationship with everyone there. And they know you and they trust you. I didn't find that it was a problem filming people at all. Um, I think it went pretty smoothly. I didn't think they were like uncomfortable. I thought it was quite good, the whole yeah, experience. One lady said she didn't want to be I think there was, yeah, there was one lady who didn't want to be filmed, but you know, that's normal. I think not everybody wants to be on camera, but most people were up for it, weren't they? Yeah, I think in Japan, they're more receptive to, um, they don't seem to mind being filmed as much. No, that's, that's what we found with the BBC as well. So, um, but James, he asks, can you tell us a bit more about how you had the idea about the making of the documentary. So you knew what I was doing there, but you were the one who chose the way to make the film and edit it and so on. Do you have well, anything to process, say? There. there was a process while we were there. <coughs> we spent a lot of time every day with each other and with the Kuma guys, which I said thank you actually for Mrs. Kuma guy feeding us every day because that gave us a lot more time and we could talk over lunch and we had chances after lunch to have a discussion about the filming and sort of ideas came naturally about how everything should be presented just on the go really we weren't able to plan beforehand it was more during the filming and then a bit afterwards and then james did the majority of the editing and would talk to me a little bit about it but it was mainly then your vision afterwards wasn't it so that's, um, that question came from Andrea De Antoni, and we can put, I can put you in touch with each other if he wants to know more, because he's a good friend and a former student, so. Is that, does yeah, that I mean, a lot of footage, and I think we had to really think about what we could include and what we couldn't. I mean, we wanted to use as much as possible, right? Mm. Um, but some, because of the budget and the timing and some of the stuff, not everything um, came out as good as we'd hoped when it came to the filming aspect. And it was difficult to, because there was such a time limit and there was so much, like every day was full on, wasn't it, Joy? So um, it was difficult 
difficult to go back and if there were any problems um, to kind of refilm anything, we couldn't just do that. So that and D James, don't go away because there's another question for you here, which is, it says you took your whole family to the field. How did your field work influence your family? How do your children today deal with this family history? How do you feel about the fact that you came with me to do field work? William, my other son is there. I don't know if he's still there. Maybe not because he's busy working. So, <clears throat> William K, there he is. I've allowed William to talk. Oh, he's coming on now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, James, what were you going to say first? And then William can say if he wants to. Oh, William, you have to undo, you'll have to. Um, Allow yourself to speak, undo the micro. Yeah, that's it. Hi there. Oh, it's uh... Hi, Will. Hi there, what's the question? Um, you took your whole family to the field. How did your field work influence your family? How do your children today deal with this family history? Um, well, it was a great privilege, I think, for all of us, uh, you know, as a family, um, and James and myself in particular to have that experience you know um i haven't been back much i don't think james had been back for a long time um but you know the the memories of growing up um sort of as a six-year-old in my case um are really deep and profound and uh something something we treasure but uh yeah i, I don't <laughs> i don't think that um uh, yeah, I, 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 I think this important part of our of our family history. I guess I'm just trying to answer, think how to answer that part of the question. But um, yeah, I don't know how much it shapes us as a family. Maybe you can have a better perspective on that. James, you you found it quite emotional, didn't you, being back there where you, where I was with Dad and everything? <clears throat> do you want to, do you want to add anything to that, or have you? Is that what Will said, pretty much? Well, I think it's a, it was um, a good opportunity to try to put on film um, to show what, what it is that you actually do, which is um, connecting with other people, developing relationships with other people. And um, that I think that that's how you um, understand other people's perspective. You have to make a kind of human connection with someone and I think you've got a great ability to do that. And from the moment we got there, following you around the village, people were just stopping and saying hello, Joy Hendry, Hendry San, Hendry San. And we wanted to call it Hendry San initially because that's just what we kept on hearing. As soon as we wandered around the village, a car would stop, a bicycle would stop. We'd hear it from one house or another house. Someone would come running out. And that you'd, um, you'd managed to get to know everybody in the village. And I could see that... Um, that's something that doesn't always come across in the sort of message that you're teaching in anthropology, which is understanding other people's perspective, but actually how you do that on a day-to-day -day level and how you are managing to do that, I think, um, I, I, yeah, I think it was interesting to be able to show that in the film, because I think- So, so some I, of the secrets of behind the work that I did that you were revealing. I think, I think they're crucial secrets because this is, this is the, um, this is the important difference from stereotyping people who you just see as an image on television or you have as an out, outside concept which you haven't met them but it's, if you spend you know five minutes with someone you make so many connections to them or if you spend longer and get to know them and then their family history you can't you can you can you the thing becomes a lot more personal and relatable and I think that you have a great ability to do that and that's something that's an important aspect in that I think um, people can learn from in the, the research, that your research, um, your, your technique. Yeah, I think I've got a point to add on that is that I think the fact that you went back multiple times built up that connection and that trust. So, um, like, I think this whole theory of the research and then the practical side and then obviously the pra I think the practical like meeting people face to face building up that um, relationship with people is really important but that the fact that it went beyond just a one-time moment and that you went back and they you became part of their village in a way even though you were a foreigner and outsider when you were there you were still very much 
it felt from my perspective that you'd become part of the village and you know and the village life and they yeah. are so I, happy I, I, back, giving you presents and welcoming you and wanting to do loads of stuff with you hey, like when james was, yeah, yeah when james was born i was there before james was born i went back with the bbc after he was born when I left Japan after doing that filming with the BBC, I had to be given loads of, um, of agricultural uh, cooperative bags to put all the presents they sent to James in. And at the airport, I had to persuade them to let me take them with me because they were way over the limit. <clears throat> so presents is another thing I've written about in, in the book. So, um, and also, I've, thank you very much for that. It was really good. There's, there's, another, there's some other questions here um, which... I don't think we can do them all, but David probably. But it says, um, uh, could you use your experience in school in England, in secondary schools and in education? We're doing it, trying to do it in Scotland, and as you know, some of the students and the teacher are, are here. But um, in England, they act the A level, so it needs to be put back. And David. There's a job for the director of the RAI to help us get the A-level back or teaching anthropology in, in England again, because one of the people has asked that. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah. Did you see another question I thought was quite interesting about the gender politics, and it's something that I definitely noticed, and I think you talked about it when you were there as a researcher, um, people were asking you, like, where, where's your husband, and when's the researcher coming, because they thought, it wasn't you a woman, it was yeah, a man, true. and yeah. that's all playing out now. When we went to the village hall, it was mainly men looking at your research and the women were giving the tea. So it's like the gender uh, politics there hasn't changed much as well. I know, I, I know. hear more yeah. about what you have to say on that. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, it's true. What they kept asking whether it was really me doing the research and not Dennis sitting at home. Um, <laughs> actually doing his own work, he was doing his own work, but... Um, we deliberately left that in, that's, that's one of the... We deliberately women serving it. tea, yes, all the, all the people who were receiving the things in the village hall were men, and they're the Yakuin, they're the uh, officials for the village, and the people serving tea were women, this is true. I was a bit shocked by that as well, but that is the case, but heads of houses can be women, uh, and you know they would then represent the house and some houses had only women but maybe they don't become members of the village council i wondered initially if that's again like i said sort of a village life thing and that obviously in village life it's not as forward thinking as like the cities but then me and james ended up in tokyo afterwards and we saw a lot of women with like uh, bicycles and pushing babies around and we later found out that because of uh, and in Japanese society even in the cities mainly women are at home and it's more men doing high-powered jobs so there seems to be uh, a big gender politics I think in general going yeah on. yeah well, well well lots of people have written about this Nadine and we'll talk about it later but um, one of my students who I don't think is here well I did invite but it is very late in Japan um, did a study of how women of my generation worked really hard to try and do everything, to work and to have a home life. And their children, so more her generation, um, had decided to give up on that idea and focus on the home and not go commuting off to work. And so there are women who've decided that staying at home is a better deal. But then another, you know, there's loads of stuff written. I'll, 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 if you're interested, I'll put you onto some stuff because it's a very good question. But I've just seen another question which I would like to answer if I may, because that picture is it's the artist of that picture behind me. And she's asked a good question. She says, do you think the fact that people spoke about intimate details was because you were a stranger who had arrived and would go away taking their secrets with you? And she said she was once a visiting artist and found that people talked to more because she was a stranger. <clears throat> well, I think that might be true because when I went with um, uh, when I went with the children, one of my students came and she was teaching people English, and they would tell her stuff in English that they wouldn't. They never told me in Japanese. So almost as if speaking a different language means you can be more intimate. So although we were speaking Japanese, it may be that she's right that being a stranger, you do learn more than people who live there all the time might do. So thanks, Helen, for your question. And thanks for my beautiful picture of Warnford Meadow. <clears throat> um, 
Oh, I think we're nearly at the end, David. I think I've come nearly to the bottom of these questions. Oh, I don't know. Let's see. Um, can you see any more? I think that you've answered them very thoroughly and very well. Can I just say that we've, we've, we thought that the film was about your return of your materials and um, so we were trying to capture that. We weren't, we didn't, we, we thought there was a kind of fine line there between what we show as cultural stuff and how we include that in the narrative. And we didn't really have the time to interview everybody about what their experience of mum was. And I think that that would be a film in itself just because of how many people we've met and how many storylines there, there were, it would have bubbled everything up. Um, and it was kind of in hindsight, that's a really good point of a few people and would have kind of completed everything. It would have made, it would have made the film a lot longer and would have made it feel more complete. But I think it sort of, um, sets us up for doing a round two on it potentially because I think that's that's a story in itself from, from the perspective of the village and mum and the other thing to add to that would be that there were it, we heard that there were other villages who were jealous that mum was researching this village in particular so I think it's a point of pride for the village to have a researcher there for so long coming and going amongst the other villages so I think that might have affected their standing maybe in the hierarchy of the local villages so I think that was an interesting point but apart from that we enjoyed it and it was a very good experience and thank you everybody for having us and thank you everyone for listening yes thank you for coming to along and thank you for making the film and uh yeah the, I've, I've found some more questions but do you think we've gone on too long David it's well, um, I, I, I think I think probably some people need to go I, I, well, they can I, go. I, they, they, yes. they are going actually they are I think Yes. People can drop yeah. off. I wanted to ask the one about the US. There's, someone said in the US, very little anthropology in high schools and that they teach homeschool students. Yes, someone in, yeah, I saw that. Hello, this is Emma. I've just put um, some information in the chat. If people want to join us in further discussion about education in the UK and worldwide, actually having anthropology in classrooms, I popped a link in there, you can find out more about our commission and it's completely free to join our mailing list. Oh, that's good oh, then. Thank you Emma, that's, that, that's, that's a very good thing that you've done. I think I'm coming towards the end, what, well, let me cultural materials are repaired. Oh, there was one from Australia. <clears throat> Often when cultural materials are repatriated where I work in Australia, there are contestations for possession or control of those materials among the home community. It's a very difficult situation as an anthropologist trying to do the right thing. Did you encounter difficulties in working out to whom the materials should be returned and how did you? Okay, I can answer that because when we um, <clears throat> took the materials to um, the previous head of the village who you saw in his house where there was lovely artwork and flower arrangements, um, he said, I don't want to put them in the village hall because people might go off with them. I'm going to hand them from head to head as new people become the heads. <clears throat> So I thought, well, that's great. He'll keep them, they'll be, keep them safe. And then if anyone wants to see them, they know where to go. However, when I called the families, the family with the children who appeared in the film, oh yes, and I sent the film, the YouTube to him because he has email. And I called him and he said, I've got it, I've made a DVD and we're sending it round. When I called the family with the children, they hadn't received it. So I explained to them how they could get their children onto YouTube to do it. And I think, <clears throat> that I'm, you know, I know that that family, the Shabbatas, who, uh, whose greenhouses you saw with all the chrysanthemums, <clears throat> the BBC film uh, happened to be made when there was a wedding in that family, so they focused a lot on that family and the, the weddings. And when I went back, they told me they'd been discriminated against. So um, this isn't Australia, Australian Aboriginal culture, but I think, as Nadine said, that in any small community, there will be difficulties and contestations as you call them so maybe there is something there but I'm hoping that wasn't that um, a bigger place there's only now 45 houses and I'm and they know me and I can be in touch with them and I'm hoping they will share everything I took every actually I took all the individual family trees to the houses one by one so every house has their own family trees 
um, and it's not something that has to be shared and handed out. So thank you for that question. That was because I work with Indigenous people in, in Canada and in First Nations, and I know that different um, um, there are different things. Oh, here's one from Hakan. Turkish question, David. <coughs> thank you so much as well. Here's my question. When I was watching it, uh, about the concept of rapping. Oh, perhaps you've asked me that one already. Oh, you, when you were, <coughs> which I, I thought when you, what you were doing during a documentary was actually sort of rapping too, rapping of what you experienced in the actual space and together with the village people that you know for these audiences in front of the screen who may not be familiar with the context. What would you say about your role between these two audiences? Also curious about what happens when you switched off the camera in such a context. Thank you for that question. I've never met Hakan yet, but I'm looking forward to it. He wrote a brilliant book about Japan, <coughs> television in Japan. And um, the answer is that they were, um, I was doing that. That's what I was doing. That's why you didn't get the Japanese voices because I was presenting what they said to me so that people who would view the film and listen to the commentary in English would understand. And James and Nadine um, edited out the Japanese so that it would be more was wrapped for an English speaking audience, which is why we would like to possibly to do another film with the same materials that would have um, more, something just fell down, I think. That would have more, um, uh, wrap, be wrapped in a different way, to use your language. And thank you for the question. So that's that one. It's the Turkish man. Um, you mentioned how stress. Uh, yeah, we've had done about the stress, how to deal with stress. Oh. Yes, lovely Japanese baths is the way to deal with stress in Japan. Japanese people bathe every evening and the baths are wonderful for dealing with stress. How, and how much did the communication, communication with your supervisor impact on your fieldwork? I was doing my fieldwork when I could only write letters and our letters were very um, <clears throat> few and far between. Um, <clears throat> so my relationship with the supervisor happened when I got back he threw away my first chapter. He might even be here. I did invite him. He's certainly seen the film, <coughs> Peter Riviere. Um, do you remember that, Peter, throwing away my first chapter? Shall I throw it away or will you, I think he said. So the relationship happened when we got back, when I got back. Indoor shrines, you've asked that, you've asked, oh. There, Linda's saying she loves your contribution, James. Linda Colin Bockers, who teaches anthropology in uh, Scottish school, Scottish college actually. What do you think about the inherent disparity between the scholar and the subject of study? Yes, objective, subjective. And somebody else asked me about drawing a line between professional distance and the emotion. <coughs> well, um, as I said earlier, when I went to the meeting in the village hall and they said this, here's Professor Henry, I tried to make a point of saying I'm always a student here and I try very, my very best to fit in and get along with people without um, distancing myself when I'm there. And then when I get back to try to put back up the professional, uh, well, I used to when I was working, I'm now retired, I can do anything I like. <laughs> so uh, it's a little different. Gender politics, somebody's asked about, and we've talked about that. Carmen Tamas question. Uh, I've forgotten what Carmen asked now, it's back further up. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you for your nice comments about the film, everybody who's put them in. Feeling when I handed over the documents was wonderful. Really nice, a relief to be able to do it. Um, uh, people used, oh, Yago to tell one another a parting conversations. Yes. Yes, they do. They do. That's absolutely right. There's the woman who used to make oil and there's the woman up at the East End with the, they do. Uh, that's um, Aileen Delaney and thank you for your question and she's asking about the names people use for each other because they all have the same surnames. Definitely they do have small different names. We really enjoyed the film. Um, why the family trees matter. Mm -hmm. Okay so because yes I think I've answered that actually pretty much. Um, they mattered because I had to get permission to, to make them in the first place and I wanted to give them back to the people who gave their permission so they would have them and they wouldn't be out of their 
Um, and that's partly working with indigenous people who resented anthropologists taking away their knowledge. Um, were you tempted to record of what the villagers said and did by cassette tapes? <clears throat> no, I didn't because I tried it once and it broke down. And I, me, me, I've put this in the book too. Making notes gives people time to think and say more things. And I did it all my years and advised my students the same. Changing food habits. Ooh. Well, Miss, Mrs. Kumagai went to a lot of trouble to make vegan food for, my, for James and Nadine, and it was wonderful. Oh, at Sushi, my grandfather gave us our family cemetery an apology after the village. Oh, so his grandfather apologized at the family cemetery for causing Murahachibu after it was finished. And he says it helped deep understanding and trust. And Japan, staying with them helped deep understanding and trust for each other's cultures. Japanese rural culture was relatively uninformed in the 1970s, but we have been changing from uniform to mixed tape. What kind of approach do you recommend for new researchers? Ooh, I think I have to ask you, because you're a young man, younger man. Really enjoy it. Um, okay, purpose of family trees. <coughs> Oh, I think I think I, we've pretty much done them, except um, oh yeah, we've had Julia Thomas. Oh, I teach anthropology to IB students, and a number of them are watching now. When they encounter fieldwork, they always ask how an anthropologist chooses who they connect with initially, and what impact that might have on their fieldwork in the long term. So I had no choice because Professor Matsunaga introduced me to the head of the village and he invited me to his son's wedding. And then I was um, helped by, uh, I, I went gradually around from house to house. Actually, I was going to show you a picture of a lady who used to do the rice milling, who sat in front of her house and stopped me every day and introduced me to appropriate people. So that's all in the book. Uh, there we go. Um, I think that's everything. Except back to Carmen, I can't remember what her question was. And she's probably gone to bed because it's now very late in Japan, but I'm in touch with her anyway. So thank you, David. I think we've probably given the questions, unless anyone's still sitting there waiting for their question to be answered, they could raise their hand now. But most people have probably gone home, haven't they? Two participants raised their hand. One says, thank you very much. Should I, still, should I still uh, let the raised hand speak? Do you want? Yeah, I'm that? still here. Okay, so I will be allowing uh, Rachel McNair Smith uh, to speak. Rachel, you was the one we couldn't get unmute before. Yourself? So. Unmute yourself, Rachel. Yeah, you are still muted, Rachel. Didn't she come up before and we passed over that? Maybe because she didn't unmute herself. And there's somebody else, so Rick. There's also Ricky Jacobson, yes. I'm going to allow Ricky to speak. Let's see if she comes through. He unmutes himself. No, there, I think he did it, maybe. Yeah, he's unmuted. So, Ricky, is that how you pronounce your name? Uh, yeah, hi. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi. So, I'm a Japanese student in uh, Denmark. And I have my exam soon. And I was wondering about, you talked about the gifting culture. Oh yeah, I saw you. In the village. And I, we actually have like a, a subject about this. So I thought it to be very interesting to hear like your opinion about the gifting culture, like at weddings or when you gave it to your neighbors. Okay, Ricky, well, that's a very good question. And I've written all about it in a book called Wrapping Culture. Um, and it's a lot. Um, and, and other places too, uh, because wrapping, I mean, giving gifts, gift giving is a really important part of Japanese culture and there's lots written. Why don't you send me an email and I'll send you some things to read if you haven't found them yourself. My email is really easily available. Just type my name into Google and it comes up. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's not a quick quest, not a quick answer. Yeah, exactly. Did, we have Rachel? did she put, did she undo her? 
And can we say something about the packaging thing and what we felt about it, the present giving? Okay, so <laughs> um, we felt like it was kind of over extravagant. Um, obviously, it's not our culture, and we can understand it's a way to connect with people. But it got to the point where I think now in this day and age, like, I think the Japanese culture needs to revalue this whole concept because it's so overindulgent, and we saw how much packaging and plastic was. <laughs> Well, the plastic, yeah, the plastic and the wrapping. Do you know, there's a woman who works for CNN who, in Tokyo and also Hong Kong, and she's Japanese but re re reared in Britain, raised in Britain. And she rang me the other day and she's doing a, a, a TV programme about wrapping in Japan. And she said, Japanese culture needs to change. They've got to stop all this wrapping. And I said, well, you try. <laughs> because I, people have been saying that for a long time. When I was doing the research on wrapping in 1980s, they were still doing it. When I was in, in Australia in 1984, everyone was saying, you've got to stop all this wrapping. Well, so you can see why it's managing, important. People are managing to stop all sorts of things all over the world. I don't see why the Japanese can't stop it. Oh, all right. Okay. I mean, anyway. it's not meant to be a dig, it's just the fact that I think all with culture and understanding culture, it's like from, say, we're vegans and people say, well, eating meat is part of your culture, but culture doesn't necessarily mean it's right, like morally, like especially in this day and age when we have all these social problems and environmental problems, right. we have to co continually question our cultural practices, if they're relevant and That's if they're because serving Actually, them, actually things in Japan, things in Japan that have changed over the years, suddenly change. So it may be that people will suddenly stop all the wrapping they do, suddenly stop using um, so much plastic wrapping and plastic paper. So let's, so, let's so keep our fingers crossed. Hope Apparently for the best. they're charging 10p for plastic bags now in Japan. Good, good. good. Yep, that's good. But I would say it was probably like the, one of the worst places for plastic. Yeah. On the I know, I know, I know. It's in the book. I've written it in the book as well. Same thing, and and but yeah. Same, but on the balance, there is a balance to that. And that's the way that you you said a lot of people recycle the gifts. We recycle the gifts that we were given. So they we do, yeah. And then we gave them on to other people, and it seemed that we were probably receiving gifts that had been recycled. I think the act of giving gifts to everybody is really important um, in, you know, for, you know, developing and keeping your bonds and friendships going and all of that. And it was sort of, for us, kind of culture shock to see people. We went on the trains and saw people were carrying several bags full of basically gifts, you know, that they received from one lot of relatives and having to take home with them. And, you know, maybe it isn't as wasteful as we might, maybe it's not the most wasteful thing there because it does seem, they just seem to get recycled. So they just seem to be handed yeah. on. Yeah. yeah, so there you are, Ricky. There's some things to think about for you, for your exams coming up, even without... Uh, it's a level of politeness as well. I wonder how many people just, it's social conditioning and how much... Definitely. You know, the way you... And if they really want to do it, and they're just doing it out of politeness because they have to, you know. Absolutely, that's absolutely right. <laughs> I can't. Okay. I can't find any more questions. Is anybody else desperately waiting to ask a question? Or um, I, I went back to try and find Carmen because someone said my question is the same as Carmen, but I can't find Carmen. Do uh, I myself have a meeting now? So I'm going to have to say thank you very much. Okay, but and you, know, you carry on you carry on talking as much as you like of course uh, but i i must slip off but thank you for a, a wonderful afternoon and i look forward to the next thank case you. thank you everybody for listening if you want to become a fellow of the rei please just write to us and, and support our work we would uh, uh, very very much like to make your acquaintance uh, and if you're an existing fellow we'll see you at the rei soon when this crisis is over so thank you very much thank you david thank you for chairing and thank you I think we should let Nadine and Emma, I mean, Nadine, Hanin and Emma go too, because they, they've worked an hour beyond the time they signed up for. There you are, Emma. <clears throat> and I can see the sunshine outside, and I want to go and get a bit of it before the end of the day. So thank you, Nadine and James, for coming. Thank you, everybody, and for coming. Else came. 
thank you so much, Joy, for your time, for going okay. through all oh, the questions and trying to answer all of them. Great. Wonderful. Bye.